Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is power distribution of parallel AC circuits. Our objective is to examine several illustrated examples of parallel AC circuits, including analysis of power. This lecture operates under the presumption the viewer has more than a passing familiarity with both parallel AC circuit analysis and AC power calculations, as illustrated in the AC circuit analysis playlist, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you lack the requisite level of familiarity with these topics, please review the aforementioned supporting material and return to this lecture when you are so qualified. Mastery of power calculation and parallel AC circuits necessitates active participation on your part, and as such, I'm encouraging you to please pause the lecture when asked to do so and attempt the example problems on your own. If your answers do not match those illustrated, by all means, feel free to rewind the lecture and correct any mistakes you may have made. Our first example problem features a parallel combination of two elements. The first element is a 330 ohm resistor, and the second element is a 12 microfarad capacitor. Stage one of this example problem necessitates we solve for the voltage drop across each element, the current through each element, and the source current. Once we've got these values, we'll move on to stage two and examine power distribution within this parallel circuit. By all means, pause the lecture and try stage one on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The complex impedance of the 330 ohm resistor is 330 ohms at an angle of zero degrees. Let's call this impedance Z1. The complex impedance of the 12 microfarad capacitor at 60 hertz is roughly 221 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Let's call this impedance Z2. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. This is the most fundamental property of parallel circuits. It can be said that supply voltage equals V1, which equals V2. A Kirchhoff's current law analysis of this parallel circuit suggests that source current equals I1 plus I2. Now that we have established a basic framework for this parallel AC circuit, we can move on to solve for individual desired properties. There are several ways to obtain these desired figures. Perhaps the easiest and most direct means of doing so is through the use of Ohm's law, followed by a subsequent Kirchhoff's current law analysis. Ohm's law suggests that the current through impedance Z1 equals 363.6 milliamperes at an angle of zero degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates voltage and current are perfectly in phase with one another for this purely resistive element. A second iteration of Ohm's law suggests that the current through impedance Z2 equals 542.9 milliamperes at an angle of positive 90 degrees. Phasor diagram illustrates current leads voltage by a full 90 degrees for this purely capacitive element. Note the smaller impedance magnitude Z2 appears to be drawing more current than the larger impedance Z1. Given the nature of a parallel circuit is dominated by the element drawing the most current, one might expect this larger circuit to exhibit primarily capacitive characteristics. Additionally, given voltage across elements in parallel is the same, the larger amount of current drawn by the capacitor might yield a larger apparent power figure for the capacitor, whereas the smaller amount of current drawn by the resistor might yield a smaller apparent power figure for the resistor. Given these two applications of Ohm's law, we now know the current through both elements. Application of Kirchhoff's current law demonstrates that source current equals 653.4 milliamperes at an angle of 56.2 degrees. Note the phasor diagram indicates source current leads source voltage by 56.2 degrees, thereby cluing us in that the combined impedance does have primarily capacitive nature as we anticipated. As a means of checking these calculations, one could solve for total impedance, where the parallel combination of Z1 and Z2 is found to be approximately 183.7 ohms at an angle of negative 56.2 degrees. Note the total impedance does indeed appear to be primarily capacitive, given the negative angle. Using this total impedance figure, another manipulation of Ohm's law also suggests source current will be 653.4 milliamperes at an angle of 56.2 degrees. This matches the figure we obtained previously with Kirchhoff's current law. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence our voltage and current calculations are correct, and we can move on to stage two of this example problem. Given these voltage and current figures, see if you can calculate the apparent, real, and reactive power for each individual element and the total parallel circuit. Recall, power calculations necessitate the use of relative phase shift between voltage and current. Luckily, voltage across elements in parallel is the same, and we're employing source voltage as our reference. This means we really don't have to worry about the conversion between absolute and relative phase shift as we do with series circuits, and we are ready for liftoff. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, 
you should have obtained the following results. Let's examine each individual element in turn, and then take a look at the whole circuit. It can be said, current through the resistive element Z1 is in phase with the voltage across it, and there exists a relative phase shift of zero degrees between voltage and current. As such, for this purely resistive element, we should anticipate all of apparent power to be directed towards real power, and none of it towards a reactive interchange. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 43.6 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the resistor is directing 43.6 watts towards real power and zero vars towards a reactive interchange. This is to be anticipated given the purely resistive nature of this particular element. Given there exists no relative phase shift between voltage and current, all apparent power will be directed towards real power. Let's now examine the capacitive impedance Z2. It can be said current through this capacitor leads the voltage across it by a relative 90 degrees. As such, for this purely capacitive element, we should expect all of apparent power to be directed towards a reactive interchange. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 65.1 volt amperes at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates this capacitor is directing zero watts towards real power and negative 65.1 bars towards a reactive interchange. This is to be anticipated given the entirely reactive nature of a capacitor. Note the complex conjugate operation accounts for the negative reactive power sign. Although I personally loathe this terminology, you'll sometimes hear people referring to a capacitor as supplying reactive power. Let's now examine the larger circuit. Given our larger circuit is composed of only two elements, one consuming 43.6 watts of real power and the other supplying 65.1 bars of reactive power, one might anticipate the total power to be the summation of 43.6 watts and negative 65.1 bars. Let's see if this is the case. It can be said that source current leads the supply voltage by a relative 56.2 degrees. Total apparent power is the complex conjugate of source voltage times source current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 78.4 volt amperes at an angle of 56.2 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates real power is 43.6 watts and reactive power is negative 65.1 bars. Note total real power is the same value as that consumed by the resistor and total reactive power is that same value as supplied by the capacitor. This is far from a coincidence and illustrative of a very important fact. Apparent power input equals apparent power output. For this two element parallel AC circuit, total apparent power equals apparent power to element one plus apparent power to element two. ST equals S1 plus S2. Note apparent power can be considered as having both a magnitude and a direction. Counting for angles, the apparent power delivered to the resistor is pointed entirely in the positive real horizontal X dimension whereas the apparent power delivered to the capacitor is pointed entirely in the negative imaginary vertical y-axis. Accounting for direction, the summation of apparent power delivered to these two elements yields a total apparent power figure of 78.4 volt amperes at an angle of negative 56.2 degrees. Importantly, this figure verifies our earlier total apparent power calculation. Alternatively, one can solve for total real power and total reactive power independently using a similar technique. Total real power input to this system equals the summation of individual real power outputs. PT equals P1 plus P2. Similarly, total reactive power for this system equals the summation of individual reactive powers. QT equals Q1 plus Q2. Doing so yields a total real power of 43.6 watts and a total reactive power of negative 65.1 bars. Importantly, these figures again verify our earlier calculations. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence we're correct and can move on to another challenge. Our second illustrated example problem features a parallel combination of three elements. The first element is a 470 ohm resistor. The second element is a 2.2 microfarad capacitor. And the third element is a 250 millihenry inductor. The source has an effective value of 40 volts and an excitation frequency of 150 hertz. Stage one of the example problem necessitates we solve for the voltage drop across each element, the current through each element, and the source current. Once we've got these values, we'll move on to stage two and examine power distribution within this parallel circuit. 
by all means, pause the lecture and try stage one on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The complex impedance of the 470 ohm resistor is 470 ohms at an angle of zero degrees. Let's call this impedance Z1. The complex impedance of the 2.2 microfarad capacitor at an excitation frequency of 150 hertz is approximately 482.3 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Let's call this impedance Z2. Finally, the complex impedance of the 250 millihenry inductor at an excitation frequency of 150 hertz is approximately 235.6 ohms at an angle of 90 degrees. Let's call this impedance Z3. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. This is the most fundamental property of parallel circuits. It can be said that supply voltage E equals V1, which equals V2, which equals V3. A Kirchhoff's current law analysis of this parallel circuit suggests that source current equals I1 plus I2 plus I3. With this important groundwork established, we can now begin an analysis of this larger parallel circuit. There are several ways to obtain the desired figures. Perhaps the easiest and most direct means of doing so is through the use of Ohm's law, followed by a subsequent Kirchhoff's current law analysis. Ohm's law suggests that the current through impedance Z1 equals 85.1 milliampers at an angle of zero degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates voltage and current are perfectly in phase with one another for this purely resistive element. A second iteration of Ohm's law suggests that the current through impedance Z2 equals 82.9 milliampers at an angle of 90 degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates current leads voltage by 90 degrees for this purely capacitive element. A third iteration of Ohm's law suggests that current through impedance Z3 equals 169.8 milliampers at an angle of negative 90 degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates current lags voltage by 90 degrees for this purely inductive element. Given three applications of Ohm's law, we now know the current through all three elements. Application of Kirchhoff's current law demonstrates source current equals 121.6 milliampers at an angle of negative 45.6 degrees. As a means of checking these calculations, one can solve for total impedance, where the parallel combination of Z1, Z2, and Z3 is found to be approximately 329 ohms at an angle of 45.6 degrees. Note that the total impedance appears to be somewhat inductive given the positive angle. Using supply voltage and the source current we obtained using Kirchhoff's current law, a manipulation of Ohm's law also suggests total impedance will be approximately 329 ohms at an angle of 45.6 degrees. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence our voltage and current calculations are correct, and we can now move on to stage two of this example problem. Given these voltage and current figures, see if you can calculate the apparent, real, and reactive power for each individual element and the total parallel circuit. Again, recall power calculations necessitate the use of a relative phase shift between voltage and current. Luckily, voltage across elements in parallel is the same, and we're employing source voltage as our reference. This means we really don't have to worry about conversion between absolute and relative phase shift as we did for series circuits, and we're ready for liftoff. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Let's examine each individual element in turn, and then take a look at the whole circuit. It can be said current through resistive impedance Z1 is in phase with the voltage across it, and there exists a relative phase shift of zero degrees between voltage and current. As such, for this purely resistive element, we should expect all of apparent power to be directed towards real power. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is a complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 3.4 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components, demonstrates the resistor is directing 3.4 watts towards real power and zero vars towards a reactive interchange. This is to be anticipated given the purely resistive nature of this particular element. Given there exists no relative phase shift between voltage and current, all of the apparent power will be directed towards real power and none towards a reactive interchange. Let's now examine the capacitive impedance Z2. It can be said current through the capacitor leads the voltage across it by a relative 90 degrees. As such, for this purely capacitive element, we should anticipate all of apparent power to be directed towards a reactive interchange. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 3.3 volt amperes at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates this capacitor is directing zero watts towards real power 
and negative 3.3 vars towards a reactive interchange. This is to be anticipated given the entirely reactive nature of a capacitor. Let's now examine the inductive impedance C3. It can be said current through the inductor lags the voltage across it by a relative 90 degrees. As such, for this purely inductive element, we should expect all of apparent power to be directed towards a reactive interchange. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 6.8 volt amperes at an angle of 90 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the inductor is directing 0 watts towards real power and 6.8 vars towards a reactive interchange. This is to be anticipated given the entirely reactive nature of an inductor. Note the complex conjugate operation accounts for the positive reactive power sign. Again, although I personally loathe this terminology, you'll sometimes hear people referring to an inductor as absorbing reactive power. Let's now examine the larger circuit. Given our parallel circuit is composed of three elements, one consuming 3.4 watts of real power, another supplying 3.3 vars of reactive power, and the third absorbing 6.8 vars of reactive power, one might anticipate the total power to be the summation of 3.4 watts minus 3.3 vars plus 6.8 vars. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of source voltage times source current. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 4.9 volt amperes at an angle of 45.6 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates real power is 3.4 watts and reactive power is positive 3.5 vars. As a means of checking our work, we can also summate individual apparent powers, where total apparent power equals S1 plus S2 plus S3. Accounting for direction, the summation of individual apparent powers delivered to these three elements yields a total apparent power figure 4.9 volt amperes at an angle of 45.6 degrees. Importantly, this figure verifies our earlier total apparent power calculation. Our third and final example problem features a parallel combination of two fixed elements, one of which is a 240 ohm resistor, the second, an ideal 800 millihenry inductor, assumed to have no internal resistance. These two elements are fixed in magnitude and grouped together as a load. This load will remain constant throughout this exercise. In contrast, the third parallel element is a variable capacitor that can be adjusted up to 25 microfarads. Let's say the variable capacitor is currently not connected to this circuit, meaning at the time being, this parallel current path essentially doesn't exist. Our source has a magnitude of 208 volts and an excitation frequency of 60 hertz. For part one of this problem, I'm asking you to solve for the phasor equivalent voltage drop across each element in the fixed load, the current through each element in the fixed load, the apparent, real, and reactive power delivered to each element in the fixed load. Additionally, I'm asking you to solve for these same properties for the entire load, notably the phasor equivalent of voltage across the load, the current drawn by the load, and the apparent real and reactive power to the load. Finally, I'm asking you to solve for source current and the power factor of this larger circuit. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The complex impedance of the 240 ohm resistor internal to the load is 240 ohms at an angle of zero degrees. Let's call this impedance Z1. The complex impedance of the 800 millihenry inductor internal to the load at an excitation frequency of 60 hertz is approximately 301.6 ohms at an angle of 90 degrees. Let's call this impedance Z2. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. This is the most fundamental property of parallel circuits. It can be said that supply voltage E equals V1 equals V2, which, by the way, equals the voltage across the load. A Kirchhoff's current law analysis of this parallel circuit and the current configuration suggests that source current equals load current equals I1 plus I2. With these important properties established, we are now free to continue our analysis of this larger parallel circuit. There are several ways to obtain the desired results. Perhaps the easiest and most direct means of doing so is through the use of Ohm's law, followed by subsequent Kirchhoff's current law analysis. Ohm's law suggests that the current through Z1 equals 866.7 milliamperes at an angle of zero degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates voltage and current are perfectly in phase with another for this purely resistive element. A second iteration of Ohm's law 
suggests that the current through impedance Z2 equals 689.6 milliampers at an angle of negative 90 degrees. The phasor diagram illustrates current lags voltage by a full 90 degrees for this purely inductive element. While we're here, let's solve for the apparent, real, and reactive power for the individual elements within the load. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values for the first impedance, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 180.3 volt amperes at an angle of 0 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the resistive portion of the load is directing 180.3 watts towards real power and 0 bars towards a reactive interchange. This is to be anticipated given the entirely resistive nature of this particular element. Given there exists no phase shift between voltage and current, all of apparent power will be directed towards real power. Let's now examine the second element in terms of the load. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting our given values, we arrive at an apparent power figure of 143.5 volt amperes at an angle of 90 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the inductive portion of the load is directing 0 watts towards real power and 143.5 bars towards a reactive interchange. This is to be anticipated given the entirely reactive nature of an inductor. Now let's solve for these same properties for the complete load. There's a couple of techniques to do so. First, given the complete load is a parallel combination of two elements, one could summate properties for the individual elements. For example, Kirchhoff's current law demonstrates that current drawn by the load is the sum of the current drawn by the resistive portion of the fixed load plus the current drawn by the inductive portion of the fixed load. Substituting our given values yields a current draw of roughly 1.1 amps at an angle of negative 38.5 degrees. Similarly, apparent power to the load is a summation of the apparent power of the resistive portion of the fixed load plus the apparent power of the inductive portion of the fixed load. Substituting our given values yields an apparent power figure of roughly 230.4 volt amperes at an angle of 38.5 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the load is directing 180.3 watts towards real power and 143.5 bars towards a reactive interchange. As one might expect, the real portion of the load is that consumed by the resistor, and the reactive portion of the load is that consumed by the inductor. Alternative methods of calculating load properties exist, and we can use these methods to check our previous work. One means of doing so is lumping the individual elements within the fixed load as a combined parallel impedance. A parallel combination of Z1 and Z2 yields a load impedance of roughly 187.8 ohms at an angle of 38.5 degrees. Ohm's law demonstrates the load will draw roughly 1.1 amps at an angle of negative 38.5 degrees. The power equation demonstrates the load will experience 230.4 volt amperes of apparent power at an angle of 38.5 degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates the load is directing 180.3 watts towards real power and 143.5 vars towards a reactive interchange. These values support our earlier calculations. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence our voltage, current, and power calculations are correct. Finally, given the source is supplying 230 volt amperes of apparent power, and the load is consuming 180.3 watts of real power, it can be demonstrated that this larger circuit has a lagging power factor of 0.78, where the lagging power factor indicates source current lag supply voltage. Let's now move on to part two of this problem and illustrate the effect of including a variable capacitor in this parallel circuit. You recall that the polarity of reactive power for capacitors is opposite of that of inductors. As such, we might expect the negative bars of the capacitor to moderate the influence of the positive bars of the inductive portion of the load. As a result, total apparent power might shift towards the real horizontal x dimension. At a certain point, we might even find an occasion in which the reactive bar is consumed by the inductor to perfectly balance that supplied by the capacitor, such that all of total apparent power will be directed towards the real horizontal x dimension. This technique is known as power factor correction. We'll examine power factor correction in greater detail in later lectures. However, here's a basic primer on the subject. A power factor corrected circuit is one in which the reactive power of a fixed load is counteracted by an equal yet opposite variable reactive element such that all of total apparent power is directed towards real power 
and none of it towards a reactive interchange. To say no apparent power is directed towards a reactive interchange is somewhat of a lie. In reality, there will be a continuous, equal, yet opposite exchange of reactive power between the two reactive elements. However, quite like positive and negative, yin and yang, or fire and water, they balance each other out, such that in summation there appears to be no total reactive power. Conceptually, you might think of a power factor corrected circuit in the following fashion. Given current leads voltage for capacitors by 90 degrees and current lags voltage for inductors also by 90 degrees, there would be a relative phase shift of 180 degrees between them. This means for a perfectly power factor corrected circuit, the moment the inductor of magnetic field is building and sucking in current of a given magnitude, the capacitor is discharging that exact same amount of current. In this sense, the capacitor is dumping all its previously stored power down the inductor's throat just when the inductor bursts into the room screaming, I'm thirsty. At the opposite end of the cycle, the moment when the inductor magnetic field is collapsing and squeezing out current of a given magnitude, the capacitor is charging and sucking in this exact same amount of current. In this sense, the inductor is puking all of its stored power into the capacitor's conveniently handy bucket just when the inductor needs to get rid of it. This is perhaps the origin of the regrettable terminology, absorb and supply with respect to reactive power. Inductors are known to absorb or consume reactive power and are so indicated with a positive sign. Capacitors, in contrast, are known to supply reactive power and are so indicated with a negative sign. Again, I find these terms somewhat regrettable since reactive power is not truly consumed nor supplied, but rather continuously exchanged However, in this application, I do find they're somewhat fitting. Doesn't mean I like it, but I can understand it. In a perfectly power factor corrected circuit, an equal and opposite amount of reactive power bounces back and forth solely between the two reactive elements. Importantly, given the cyclical exchange of power occurs within the circuit itself, the source does not need to provide reactive power. As such, we might expect source current to be smaller in magnitude and perfectly in phase with supply voltage for a power factor corrected circuit. Let's see if this is the case. Let's establish some conditions for this slightly modified circuit. Again, voltage across elements in parallel is the same. This is the most fundamental property of parallel circuits. It can be said that supply voltage equals V1, which equals V2, which equals the voltage across the load, which equals the voltage across our power factor correcting capacitor. A Kirchhoff's current law analysis of this newly configured parallel circuit suggests that load current is still equal to I1 plus I2. However, source current now includes another path, where source current is equal to our load current plus current delivered to the power factor correcting capacitor. IS equals I1 plus I2 plus IC. Given these conditions, in this perfectly parallel circuit, our electrical load, modeled as the parallel combination of the 240 ohm resistor and the 800 millihenry inductor, remain fixed. As such, the resistive portion of the fixed load will continue to draw 866.7 milliamperes at an angle of 0 degrees, and the inductive portion of the fixed load will continue to draw 689.7 milliamperes at an angle of negative 90 degrees. The resistive portion of the fixed load will continue to consume 180.3 volt amperes of apparent power at an angle of 0 degrees, 180.3 watts of which is directed towards real power, and 0 vars of which is directed towards a reactive interchange. The inductive portion of the fixed load will continue to consume 143.5 volt amperes of apparent power at an angle of 90 degrees, 0 watts of which is directed towards real power, and positive 143.5 vars of which is directed towards a reactive interchange. In summation, the fixed load will continue to draw roughly 1.1 amps at an angle of negative 38.5 degrees and consume 230.4 volt amperes of apparent power at an angle of 38.5 degrees, 180.3 watts of which is directed towards real power and 143.5 vars of which is directed towards a reactive interchange. Given this is a perfectly parallel circuit, absolutely nothing has changed about the load. However, with the incorporation of the variable capacitor, there's another path for source current. When the variable capacitor is placed in parallel with fixed load, it too will draw current from the source. However, 
The capacitor will draw current leading supply voltage by 90 degrees, effectively the opposite of that drawn by the inductor. My question to you is this. How much current does the variable capacitor need to draw and how much reactive power does the variable capacitor need to supply to power factor correct this larger circuit? By all means, pause the lecture and think about this. If you're tracking, you should have come up with the following conclusion. Don't make power factor correction hard. Capacitors and inductors are essentially mirror images of one another. Given the fixed inductive portion of the load is drawing 689.7 milliampers at an angle of negative 90 degrees and consuming positive 143.5 bars of reactive power, the power factor correcting capacitor needs to be adjusted such that it will draw 689.7 milliampers at an angle of positive 90 degrees and supply negative 143.5 bars of reactive power. Can you dig it? Capacitors and inductors have equal and opposite natures. The somewhat more difficult portion of power factor correction deals with determining the actual capacitance value that will achieve this ideal scenario. This being said, it's not that hard if you're skilled at manipulating Ohm's law and or the AC power equation. There's a couple means of arriving at this figure. However, I find the easiest and most direct means of doing so is to use this formula. Apparent power equals the complex conjugate of voltage squared divided by impedance. In this case, we know our variable capacitor needs to have an apparent power figure of 143.5 volt amperes at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Given we know this desired apparent power figure and we know the voltage in this perfectly parallel circuit, we can rearrange this equation to solve for the impedance of the power factor correcting capacitor, where the impedance of the power factor correcting capacitor equals the voltage squared divided by the complex conjugate of apparent power. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at an impedance figure of roughly 301.6 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees. O-M-G. It's equal in magnitude, yet of opposite polarity as the inductive portion of this fixed load. It makes sense. Now keep in mind we're dealing with a perfectly parallel fixed load and it doesn't always work out this neat. However, for this perfectly parallel circuit, you are walking down Easy Street and it's raining $100 bills. All you've got to do is bend down and pick them up. Speaking of easy results well within your grasp, See if you can calculate the capacitance value necessary to achieve this desired impedance. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Given we know our desired impedance magnitude and the excitation of frequency, we can rearrange the capacitive complex impedance formula to solve for capacitance, where capacitance equals 1 over 2 pi f z sub c. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at a capacitance figure of roughly 8.8 .8 microfarads, well inside the range of this variable capacitor. Let's now inspect how this power factor corrected parallel circuit operates. Including the power factor correcting in this parallel circuit does not in any way affect the performance of the fixed load. This being said, the source sees another path for current, a path that is essentially the mirror image of the inductive portion of the fixed load. When current in the capacitor peaks, current in the inductor valleys, and vice versa. As Kirchhoff's current law previously demonstrated, source current is the sum of the current through the power factor correcting capacitor plus current through the load, where the current through the load is I1 plus I2. Substituting in our given values, we find the equal and opposite currents cancel each other out, and source current drops to an amount equal to that drawn by only the resistive portion of the fixed load. Source current for the power factor corrected circuit is 866.7 milliampers at an angle of zero degrees. Recall, source current in the non-power factor corrected circuit, not incorporating the capacitor, was 1.1 amps and lag supply voltage by 38.5 degrees. In contrast, source current for the power factor corrected circuit dropped to 866.7 milliampers and is perfectly in phase with supply voltage. There's several ways to calculate total apparent power for this larger parallel circuit. Total apparent power is equal to the apparent power delivered to the load 
plus the apparent power delivered to the power factor correcting capacitor. Given the load is modeled as two elements in parallel, it can be said total apparent power is equal to S1 plus S2 plus apparent power to the power factor correcting capacitor. Substituting in our given values, we arrive at a total apparent power figure of 180.3 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Again, note the equal and opposite polarities cancel each other out such that solely real power remains. Additionally, total apparent power is the complex conjugate of supply voltage times source current. Substituting in our given values, we again obtain an apparent power figure of 180.3 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Resolving this into its real and reactive components demonstrates total real power is 180.3 watts and total reactive power is zero vars. Is it really zero vars? No, no it's not. The inductive portion of the fixed load really is consuming positive 143.5 vars and the power factor correcting capacitor really is supplying negative 143.5 vars. The deal is they're juggling reactive power back and forth with each other and the source stays out of it. That's the point. Power factor correction balances reactive power within the circuit such that the source isn't supplying reactive power. As such, source current drops and appears to be in phase with the supply voltage. Here's the important part and the single feature of power factor correction I find so endlessly fascinating. Even though source current dropped and appears to be in phase with supply voltage, the load still draws the required amount of current and still receives the right amount of reactive power to continue to function as desired. Note the fixed load still draws roughly 1.1 amps at an angle of negative 38.5 degrees and still experiences 230.4 volt amperes of apparent power at an angle of 38.5 degrees, 180.3 watts of which is directed towards real power and positive 143.5 bars of which is directed towards a reactive interchange. With a perfectly power factor corrected circuit, you get the same output for less source current. Now, given that the source is providing 180.3 volt amperes of apparent power, it can be said that the larger power factor corrected circuit now has a power factor of 180.3 over 180.3 or one. We know in reality there's an ongoing equal and opposite exchange of 143.5 bars of reactive power between the power factor correcting capacitor and the inductive portion of the fixed load, but don't tell the source that. This reactive power cyclically sloshes back and forth within the circuit and doesn't require any help from the source. As an application of power factor correction, consider motors and transformers, both of which are electrical devices that operate using magnetic principles and as such necessitate the continuous consumption of reactive power. Reactive power isn't really put towards actual work, however, it must be there to generate the magnetic field essential to these devices' operation. By power factor correcting a motor, you're essentially tricking the source into supplying less source current, yet you continue to get the same amount of real power out of it. Is this fascinating or what? We'll examine power factor correction in greater detail in later lectures. Until then, this concludes this lecture. In conclusion, this lecture examines several illustrated examples of power distribution within parallel AC circuits. Additionally, we quickly examine power factor correction within parallel AC circuits. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.